Welcome to day 14. This is crazy, as you may have seen in the YouTube clip, although maybe by the time I upload it, I'll have changed it. But even at 500% speed up, this is over an hour, which means I I wrote for five plus hours that day. That is obviously a Saturday, could have been a Sunday, but man, that's a lot of writing. So if my voice gives out, I will cut this into two days or three or four. That is a lot of writing. Congratulations, Jack. Anyways, where did we leave off? Okay, so we're about halfway through the script. And Rachel... Um, I'm catching up, sorry. Rachel and the two kids, they're in the trampoline park. Um, and Rachel is telling... Lexi, that it's a high probability that she is the daughter of the guy that Rachel slept with. No surprise there. But he is a mobster, and his father, of course, is Vic Salerno, and he is the kingpin, sort of like, not he's not like a godfather guy, but he's, he's pretty big. Um, and then Rachel's clarifying that he did, she did, in fact, sleep with the son, not the grandfather, which I guess at the time he would have only been maybe his late 50s, but still she was only, you know, 20 or something, 25. But as usual, I digress. Now we pop back into the, I say the main cabin back office, which is, I need to come up with a better way, four words to describe this little cabin basically is, seems a little excessive. So the FBI is talking to Paul and he is saying jackpot. And that is in relation to, I believe they are tapping in and listening to Rachel because Paul's got headphones on. And so they've got a wire on Rachel and she is telling, although... The FBI's already got to know that, right? Because otherwise they wouldn't have made the deal with Rachel. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure what I was thinking here. Again, commentating much later on it. But I think the point is that the FBI guy is telling Paul that it's a good thing that Holly's not there because she may go crackers and bananas and that would not be good. So... In the meantime, uh, we see, speaking of text, sorry, this is a non sequitur. You see how I've got that, where are you, Paul? Where are you, dash Paul? I Googled many months ago, probably a couple, well, it was, it was a couple years ago when I was, it was really the first time I'd written a script where I was doing, going to use a fair amount of texting. And I was trying to find the convention to do that. And that is the one I landed on. It, there certainly doesn't seem to be a, a right way to do it. Some people put it in dialogue, formatted like dialogue, but that doesn't seem right. Um, so this way seems fairly logical in terms of how much time it would take up. Again, it's quicker to read than it is to talk. And I think that's the justification for that. Um, now, as always, hopefully you're reading instead of just listening because I'm jumping around and I am fixing some logic, I think based on that scene that I was just writing. Um, so I'm jumping back to the scene where they're, they're kind of sweetening the deal for uh, Lexi, trying to make it sound as good as possible. I could have sworn I already wrote all this stuff. That'd be funny if this was <laughs> a duplicate file from the day before, but not really. No, I think this is slightly different. Um, so the point here is, and when I was thinking of the script in the first place, I was like, would an 18-year-old girl, would cars and jewelry and houses and vacations and money and stuff... Could that possibly entice someone who has just found out that their aunt, her aunt, isn't her aunt and blah, 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 blah. So 
I don't know. And that's why I kind of wanted not to write the whole script, but write this scene to see if possibly she might consider that. And would she, because in a, a much earlier iteration of this, it was going to be like an eight part limited series and she was going to go and sort of um, become a part of this mob family. And then all these other things were going to happen and et cetera, et cetera. But obviously being a screenplay, we don't have that much time. So I tried to speed it along. And now once again, I've gone on a tangent and lost track. OK, so now oh no, we're not. Uh, I am jumping all over here, so I hope you can keep up. This is one time when that uh, five times speed comes back and bites you when you're doing commentary. I think I want to make it plain or, you know, who's working together, who knows what, uh, et cetera, in terms of Holly and Paul. Well, actually, Holly, who knows the least other than the kids and then you've got Paul and then you've got the FBI and then of course you've got Salerno and then you've got Rachel and really they all know a different amount and I would say that probably Rachel knows the most or at least we think she knows the most or she thinks she knows the most um yeah I so <laughs> I'm I must yeah I'm I'm obviously fixing dialogue and logic and story based on some ideas that I've had cuz I'm back on page 48 49 now It's got to be the trap Did promise They're in the Cab and Paul and Holly are sitting there. So, yeah, we're kind of back to this first time that we see them with these three laptops and they've set up their sort of command post. And Paul is talking to Holly about his best guess of what's going on, and Holly's not really interrogating him, but. Um, trying to figure out what's going on and I'm trying to do it in a not super boring way. Now I've gone back. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to go back before you can go forward. Uh, <laughs> I, I honestly don't know what I'm doing here. It is to laugh. Gosh, I... I'm not sure what led me back to to do a little rewriting in this scene at that point. I do see that biblical reference to Job slash job. Sorry, I'm not saying anything because I'm trying to <laughs> figure out exactly what's going on. Sometimes words speak louder than Written words speak louder than verbal words. I don't know what is fundamentally changing here. Um, it appears that I'm just sort of cleaning things up, maybe cutting back a little bit. Okay, and then they're talking about uh, how much of a percentage was the favoritism versus merit. So they're they're playing back and forth a little bit. Holly is, I didn't change that line, but she says next time I'll shoot for a hundred. <laughs> so apparently this is a day where I've decided, either, you know, forty five minutes into my writing for the day, I decided that the logic in the in where I was in the script wasn't working, or the story wasn't working, or I was sort of at a quasi dead end. And so what better way to fix that? And then then going back to the beginning and trying to see what changes your second or third time through. So apparently that's what I'm doing here. And I think I've mentioned this not really philosophy. I don't know what you would call it. Technique, style, 
where you get to a, I, I'm not going to speak for anyone else, I get to a certain point of a script, you know, it's usually at least, well, it should be a lot more than 10 pages because that's kind of the good old catalyst slash inciting incident. And you would hope that you would get at least that far before you realized, oh my gosh, I got to change something. So I would say maybe coming up to act one, maybe when you're into act two, and it's sort of, I, I liken it to shoveling snow by hand as you do when you live in the Midwest slash upper Midwest. And let's say you've got six inches of snow on your driveway and you don't have a snow blower. So you shovel and you shovel and you push it and you're not really moving it out of the way. And then when you finally do, some of it falls back down. So you've got to back up and then you can push it a little farther and then you get it out of the way and you got to back up and push a little farther. So that is the simile or metaphor uh, that I'm using because it seems like sometimes I get to a certain point in the story and then I'm just like, man, I just got to go back and get some momentum. And then sometimes it turns out I go back just a page or two. And apparently this time I really <laughs> felt like I needed some new momentum. So I'm going back, not to the future, but to the beginning. Um, and I'm changing a fair amount here. I think I'm trying to tighten it up somewhat. Also, having spent 14, 13 days with these characters, and that's 14, 13 writing days, which is probably 18, 19 days, because I wasn't writing every day at this point, but having spent time with them both in the writing process and then the rest of the day when I'm thinking about them doing other work, I you get to know them better and you also get to know your story better, what's working, what isn't, what's important, what can be left out, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I am going back and making some changes, hopefully for the better. I it would be interesting because I, as you see, uh, I save a draft, a dated draft of my script every day. So I could always go back theoretically and look at something I wrote on day one and go, wow, that's so much better than what I wrote on day 28 or something. But gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I would say with a rare exception, do I ever go back and say, oh, it was so much better. Or my first draft was so much better than my fifth or sixth or something. So that would be an interesting experiment. But I am not going to uh, undertake that right now. I do see that Lexi has again brought up that 14 years thing, although this is probably the, only the first or second time. Um, so th obviously the point of this scene, not that we haven't read it already and seen it already, is that Holly has got some news for Lexi. Lexi's got some news for Holly. Um, Lexi is obviously going to be surprised for a number of reasons. And what she's bringing up is asking Lexi what she remembers about her mother. I think I misspoke there. Lexi's going to be surprised, but Holly's the one who's asking, a asking Lexi. Um, and then Lexi's line about, you finally cook a good meal and now I've got no appetite. I think hopefully that speaks to a couple of things, not just literally. Um, now this line at the bottom of line seven, how screwed up do I have to be that line there? I thought about that and I thought about, well, what does Lexi really think? Does she think her mom's dead? Has Holly come right out and told her? Because when she was, you know, three, four years old, when, when Holly came and got her, she probably wouldn't have enough memory three years old I mean you would remember her but Holly obviously didn't hasn't spoken much about her so I'm wondering would you be would you my voice is changing would you be more relieved to hear that she's alive and well or maybe confirmation of something you've thought all along that your mom is dead and I don't know if in her situation, I mean, is it too cruel or crass to think um, you would feel better knowing she was dead? I don't know. That's why I wrote the dialogue. Um, 
Okay, and so now Holly is telling her, and I again, I, I'm sure this was in the the draft of the script. I haven't even checked to see what all I've changed there. But the big revelation that the mom, Rachel, was involved with the Salerno crime family, and then the deal she made. Um, and the fact that she got parole and she's out. And Lexi, needless to say, is not literally in total shock, but darn close. And I, in, I, I put that a bit abashed, which is a bit of a cringer. I hopefully will change that later if I haven't already. I mean, abashed is a fine word, but in a spec screenplay, really. I must have been away from my computer for a while because nothing is happening at this point. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, unfortunately. Okay, I just figured out why this appeared to be so long of a day of writing. I left my screen recorder running while I stepped away from the computer for about two hours. So it's not nearly as much as we thought. Thank goodness, right? So let's continue on with the scene. Um, this is basically a bunch of exposition and how do you get exposition out without it sounding like it? Uh, you can eat a meal. That's real exciting. That's never happened before. And of course, I would say most of the time when people sit down for a meal in a movie, they very rarely, sometimes they'll start it. But obviously, unless it's my dinner with Andre, wonderful movie. Um, they're not going to just sit there and eat the whole time. There's probably a lot of uneaten food in films, actually. All right, so now, you know, she's broken the thing about her mom. A, she's alive. B, she's being paroled. And now, boom, I'm a U.S. Marshal. And she doesn't come right out and say that, but I think Lexi is putting two and two together there at the top of page nine. Good old on-the-nose dialogue. Okay, I'm... I'm not your aunt. So there's another bombshell she is dropping. And nothing like in the first 10 minutes, the setup of a movie to really throw someone's world on end. I know Blake Snyder is big on setting up the world, showing the person in their normal world before it switches. And you can look at, I mean, Back to the Future. You can look at A New Hope from Star Wars. You can look at a million movies and see that you really have to establish the character in their setting and so hopefully that volleyball scene was enough to do that uh, because now Lexi's world is getting turned upside down and Holly uh, you know we had the teaser scene at the beginning and then we see her in the gym and hopefully that's enough to establish kind of what her world has been when you're jumping forward like that and you need to kind of get the story going it's, it can be a challenge, and I don't know that I am the best at setting up that character world. This is how it is before I move ahead. Now that I think about that, I hope I've done that well enough. Because this is kind of like a co-main characters, although Holly is, I would say, the protagonist. So, um, again, I hope you've been reading this because we're on page 10 now of my major rewrite, as it turns out. And Lexi has had her world turned upside down, and now she's she's nervous, she's worried, she's whatever part. Um, and, and really starting to grill Lexi, or sorry, Lexi is grilling Holly. Are you, you know, you're not even my aunt, or did you go to class to learn how to be a fake aunt. Um, what the heck is going on? So she is not too happy. And so, of course, she gets sarcastic here and, oh, darn, tomorrow's not going to work for me. And then, boom, here comes yet another anvil dropping on Lexi's head. And again, this is no surprise because if you've been watching every day of this video series, <laughs> You already know about this, but hopefully seeing, I'm probably being optimistic, but 
seeing me go back and make these revisions, not just little dialogue tweaks sometimes, but fundamentally changing how the story's going to go, the pacing, the whatever is somewhat interesting. It's interesting to me, and that's all that matters, isn't it? Um, I should be paying more attention so I know how much dialogue I'm actually changing here. Because coming from the future and commentating this, I can say that uh, most of this, I think, is pretty much how it stands in the current draft. hope that doesn't ruin anything. Now, on page 11, so, you know, this is kind of a inciting incident that just isn't like a, it's not just one line of dialogue or one action. It's sort of like the dominoes just keep falling and falling, or the anvil, as I said. Um, and it's it's happening to Lexi, even though she's not the protagonist. And I did think about that when I was writing, because obviously you want the protagonist to, to go on the journey. And it appears now that, I mean, they're both going on the journey, but it's L Lexi who feels more protagonist-y, maybe, maybe not. Um, so I'm working through, going back to looking at the dialogue here, Holly feels bad about all this. She knew the day would come. She never warmed Lexi up to the idea, which in retrospect, maybe she regrets doing, but maybe she really figured out it was the only way because until Lexi turns 18, she doesn't really have a choice. So, um... Lexi is wondering really how bad she feels about what's going on. And Holly, by saying mostly the second one, is basically, as she says in her next line, despite what maybe her initial, res initial reservations are about this, what's become this 14-year gig, she has enjoyed it more than she thought she possibly could. Because, again... On the flip side, she's been missing out on action excitement, you know, doing all this different stuff because she's been, quote, stuck, unquote, babysitting. Um, as she chews, and then Lexi's mind is drifting back to her mom because that's kind of her future. She's thinking already, you know, Holly's in my past, my mom's in the future. Uh, so I'm trying to gently get that into the conversation with a little bit of humor about the lady in the hot tub that looks hauntingly familiar. And then at the bottom of line, or of, of uh, page 11, you see Lexi still saying Aunt Holly um, and choking up and saying Aunt Holly when she realizes that Holly is leaving. So as upset as she is with her, obviously there's still affection there. There's emotions there. And I thought that was kind of neat. Um, and then that led to the thing of, wow, is your name really Holly? Is my name really Lexi? Um, and Holly isn't really emotionally ready to deal with this. So she says, um, I've jumped ahead, but it was about by the time you throw your first axe, I'll be in Miami or something like that. Now I'm jumping back. Okay. Let's just see here. So I'm, I'm, the beautiful thing about writing a screenplay is that you can go back and change things. Man, I started writing screenplays, not to digress, on paper literally on a Selectric typewriter, IBM Selectric in paper. And I can't even, I, I literally can't even imagine. Um, oh my gosh, that's just crazy. I, I just can't even imagine. How did I, how did I change dialogue? How did I change all this stuff? I mean, once you write it, you can go back and, you know, erase a few words, but when you get whole new ideas, and whole new, wow. I'm just literally sitting here thinking how I did that. It's it's just overwhelming because it's, 
I don't know if that makes you lazy in the present day. Does that make us lazy because it's so easy to fix things? Because once you type something, you can go back and strike it through, which I'm sure I did a lot and other people did. I mean, let alone paper and pencil. Oh my gosh, that, that's a crazy thought. Uh, again, I hope you've been reading more than you've been listening or maybe as much because I'm I'm trying to tweak things. I think I'm trying to, I realized I think that this scene was taking a little too long and so maybe I'm trying to shorten it a little. But that whole idea of being at a typewriter just freaks me out. And I kind of lost my train of thought of what made me even think of the uh, typewriter. Tonight, I'm going to I can do whatever. So I'm really just going over this and trying to probably pare it down a little, make sure, again, the logic's right. Um, and I think when I typically write early drafts, I probably write more things like looks around, smiles, beat, although I'm doing it here a lot, too. Um, I thought I, I, not patting myself on the back when I said Alexi's or Lexi's expression is pure WTF. I don't know that I've ever used that. I'm sure hundreds of other writers have, but I think for an actress that would like give a good shortcut of what are you feeling and how should you be acting, reacting. And then this part, as you see, I'm changing here because it, maybe it was a little schmaltzy or schmaltzy. I think schmaltzy. Um, so, which I think is typical the first time through you, you overwrite, I overwrite, and you get caught up in the words. And then it's either, wow, this scene is five pages long and it should be three. Or you just say, well, I don't know that people would really talk like that. All right, let me see what I'm doing here. I wanted to make sure that people knew what, when Lexi says at the bottom of, of page 10 about the last 14 years or not telling me about now, mostly the second part, and then the first part wasn't too terrible, you're welcome. And I obviously am rewriting this because I don't know that I'm conveying what I'm trying to say, which I just spoke about of like 10 minutes ago. So I'm not going to completely re-say it. Your mom's going to be up there. All right. So nothing major is changing. I'm just trying to come up with a better way to say it. And again, as I've spoken about many times, the words that you write, that we write as screenwriters for action and description, they matter in some sense. Um, but like when I said, Lexi stops cold, her breath catches. I think that's a pretty good description visually of what we're seeing. But I mean, a hundred writers could write that a hundred ways. And the part that I had mentioned is once you get on set, my experience is the actors know their dialogue. There's if you have if it's a real movie and you've got a continuity person, that person is reading through the script to make sure everything is right. But whether it says stops cold or stops short or stops in a huff or something, that that stuff is purely for the reader. And so I guess my point is make it as quick as possible, make it as impactful as possible, but something that I comment on when I do my YouTube live streams for scripts. Don't make it a novel and don't tell us stuff that we cannot see. And I know people go back and forth on that a lot. And admittedly, I take liberty sometimes. But in general, I would say most screenwriters who actually make a living, most readers, analysts, that sort of thing would come down on the side of keep it short and do not editorialize. Don't get too cute. Although, again, some people have done it with great success. Not one of them, obviously, is me. Um, so I've <laughs> I'm trying to fill time here because I've obviously spent I obviously am spending a lot of time 
on these few pages, really trying to get it right. And we'll have to see if I get it right tomorrow because I just realized that I, I had talked about having an hour's worth of writing even after speeding up 500%. That turn, turned out to be incorrect because I had left it on again. So this day ends in the middle of that scene. I'm still trying to work it out. I did get in a pretty good chunk of writing today, that day. And I hope to get in a good chunk next time. And I hope you're with us, the royal we, Jack, on the screenwriter's journey. So thanks again for watching. Hang in there. And let's see if we can win an Academy Award or the equivalent thereof in my dreams.